Wow. Good morning, Lighthouse Church. Yes, man. I'm excited for that men's camp. It's going to be amazing. So, Mana, please go sign up. It's going to be epic. Um, are you excited for this morning? Yes. Yes, it's been a good worship. Uh, uh, good stuff you led so well. It was really amazing. And I know that God is something really good in store for us, right? He's really doing something in our hearts, and um, I'm excited for what God is going to do. Amen? Uh, my name is Thomas, and myself and my wife, Michaela, we lead, we have the privilege to lead with, uh, alongside amazing leaders, Element Youth that happens every Friday night. It is the best place to be on a Friday if you're a teenager, and, and it's an honor to preach this morning. It really is. I want to thank the eldership team for giving me this privilege to preach. And um, we've had a good series. We're getting into gear 2024. And Heinz preached a great message last week. And uh, God's really stirring up Lighthouse Church and really moving us forward. Can you agree with that? And uh, this morning, I, I trust that you will you'll walk out with a fresh revelation of who God is and a fresh understanding of what He's called you for. And Mark Bailey is a, is a mentor of mine and a friend. A few years ago, he taught me this quote. He said, Lies are like birds that fly over your head. It's inevitable, but you choose whether it will make a nest. You choose whether it will make a nest. Today, you must know that most of life's battles, whatever that battle might look like, most of life's battles is either won or lost in the mind. Because it might not change around us, but the way that we see it can change. And that there is, in fact, life and death in your tongue. And I trust that after this morning, you will never allow your mind to stay in a negative place or that you will entertain lies. Because we have an enemy, the devil. He hates you. He really doesn't like you. But it's okay because God fights for you. And because there's a purpose over your life. And how does, he, uh, how does he show that he doesn't like us? Well, he's called the father of lies. And he lies and he manipulates. And the biggest lie is this, to make you live for yourself. That's the biggest lie. But Jesus wants to give us a life of abundance and a life of perfect peace. And that's why my title this morning is Captive. Take your thoughts captive before they take you captive. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I'm honored to stand here and I thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you will uh, lead us and guide us through everything, Jesus, that you will just let this word sink into our hearts, let it become alive in us. And I thank you, Lord, that whatever is from me, that it will come to nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, so um, the mind is a battlefield. Within your mind, within your, your thoughts, within your conscience, it's the birthplace of either negative, um, offensive, bitterness, guilt, shame, or it is a place of peaceful, loving, generous, godly thoughts. But it's up to us to choose which thoughts need to stay in our minds and which ones need to leave. And some of those thoughts that need to leave are thoughts that we've agreed over many years that has become a pattern in our life and a way of believing. And we've allowed it to stay in our mind instead of taking it captive. And how do we do that? We understand that every, every thought that contradicts God's Word, that contradicts the nature of who God is, comes from one source, the devil, and that has to leave. And the way that it does is by us understanding 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, that for we have the mind of Christ. And for us to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's how these thoughts start changing, but there's even more. And then God wants to keep us in a place of perfect peace. Now, you know, when you, when you, when you hear that perfect peace and we know the kind of life that we live in, you think, is that really possible? Perfect peace? Yes. Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. It's not me, it's the Bible. This is the truth. Those who trust in Him, those whose thoughts are fixed on Him, perfect peace. God's Word is not wrong. 
it is true. Remember, take your thoughts captive before they take you captive. This morning, I want to take us through a story in the Bible through Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1. Uh, But before we get there, I want to read for you what happened in Matthew 3 verse 17. What happened is, uh, this is Jesus. He comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. Right, he's about 30 years old. He's worked as a carpenter. He has uh, been around people and he has done life. He knew who he was. He knew that he was the son of God, but he knew he had to get baptized. And uh, what happens in this significant moment is that a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. God in that moment affirms to the witnesses and to Jesus, you are my beloved son and I'm well pleased with you. In that moment, there's an acknowledgement of sonship and authority has been given and, and, and just in a, who God is is established in, the, in that moment. His identity is established. Are you with me? Right? Now, you take moments like that, take it in account with uh, our life. This, this is a moment of affirmation, a moment of acknowledgement. And you think about your life when things go a little bit better and there's certain stuff that you're applying in your life. Like, for example, let's say you didn't come to church for a long time, and now you started coming back again. You started serving again. You started getting alive again, but then all of a sudden, different challenges start popping up in your life. Like there's a little bit of tension somewhere. Or another one is you got, a, you got an increase at work. That's nice. Eh? A lot of us, that's, a good, that's, a good, that's good news, right? You get an increase at work. But what happens with that is that there could be an increase in your workload, which affects your time which affects the responsibilities that you have, right? Uh, Or you have a little baby, this new life. It's exciting, but then your marriage takes a little bit of strain because the babies demand a lot of time. Or you started reading your Bible a lot more. You started praying a lot more, but then all of a sudden all temptations and all lies just pop up for, for, for some reason. It just starts appearing in your life again. Why? You're not alone. It's good to understand that, yes, God brings increase in our life. God upgrades our life. God blesses us. But sometimes you have to understand that God also tests our hearts. He doesn't tempt us with evil. The Bible says that God doesn't tempt us with evil. But He does taste our hearts. But in the same line, we've got to understand we have an enemy. The devil who wants to destroy you through lies and manipulation. He cannot come. He cannot rip us apart and say, you're done. Now, if he could have done that, he would have done that long ago. But it's understanding that he is the father of lies. But that there's certain times in our life that we get increases, things go well. But when we're following God, we cannot expect everything to go our way. We have to understand that there will always be a tension between the flesh and the spirit. There is a war going on for your life and over your life. Right? Remember, take your thoughts captive before they take you captive. So let's read through the temptation of Jesus. This is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, and this is, I want you to really take note of everything that is said here. So it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Wow. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, Jesus answered, It is is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and sat upon the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Now the devil quotes the scripture. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. So Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all this I'll give to you. If you fall down, you worship me. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Three things I want us to take out of this passage of scripture to remember. Is number one is the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted Why? Number one is Hebrews 4, verse 15 to 16. He is the faithful high priest that he was tempted like we are tempted beyond in in, in every way, yet without sin, so that we can have a faithful high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. One who understands that we, we are tempted, 
we get to go to Him because He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Right? And, and looking at that passage, was, did Jesus lose that battle? No. He didn't. He came out victorious. Right? He, and, I, and with that being said, I want to encourage you this morning that the temptations that you are facing doesn't mean that you are failing. You're not a failure because you are tempted. If Jesus was tempted, you best believe we will be tempted. But he teaches us how to respond. It teaches us to depend more on Christ than we do on anyone else. And understand this, that diamonds are formed how? Under immense pressure. Second thing is, how does the devil start each lie? If you are the son of God, the very thing that Jesus just got recognized for, the sonship that is given, this is my beloved son, that's the very thing that the devil attacks. It teaches us what? That the devil, whatever the lie is, whatever the challenge is, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your finances, whether it's kids, whether it's fear, whatever it is, there's one reason the devil attacks you and it's to threaten your identity. To pull your focus away from who God says you are and to focus on all the problems and who the enemy says you are. Because remember, the enemy lies out of his own character. What he believes and what he knows about himself, he wants you to believe it about yourself. But Jesus teaches us, and that brings me to the third one. He teaches us the ultimate way to respond. And I, this is kind of the crutch of the message. I need you to get this. I need you to, if you write it down. This is Jesus, by the way, the Son of God. God himself, who could have intellectually debated with the devil and he would have won. He could have called down a legion of angels and said, Chache. But he chose to teach us how do we respond to lies? It is written. He kept going back to scripture. He didn't suppress the lie. He didn't ignore the lie. He replaced the lie with truth. Teaches us, hey, if lies come, it is written. When things try to take you captive, you take it captive with God's word. Before it takes you captive. Where does that come from? 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. It says, we demolish arguments. Friends, demolish, not tolerate lies. Not tolerate sin. We don't tolerate these things. We demolish it. And sometimes we've tolerated too much of speaking death over ourselves, tolerated small little thoughts that come into our mind and we, we act like it's nothing. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Every lie is one purpose to take your trust away from God, right? And we take captive, not relaxed, not chill it out. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Why obedient to Christ? We just sang it in the last song. Because every knee and every name that is ever mentioned will bow before the name of Jesus. So whatever the lie is, it has to bow before Jesus. It doesn't have a choice other than to bow at the name of Jesus. Amen? Come on, guys. I preach to youth. So you guys got to get excited with me here. Life will be so much better and so much more productive if we learn to take our thoughts captive. Because like I said, it doesn't mean the circumstances change. We change. We change. And if we, just like Jesus, learn to always respond with Scripture to every challenge that we face. Learn to respond with Scripture. Now are you thinking, why the Bible? Why Scripture? Why? I'll well, start with this. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. It says, all Scripture... All of Scripture, is my great book here. All of Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture comes from God. All Scripture is inspired by God. It is God's word. It's not man's word. It was written by man, led by the Spirit, breathed out by God. We can trust it. We know that it is His word. When God breathes, we see this in Scripture. When God breathes, God creates. He breathed into dust, and He created a human being called Adam. He breathes out stars. When God breathes, God creates. And this scripture, the following one, kind of adds to that. Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active. It is alive and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Why does God's word have to be sharp? 
because it is there to cut through lies. It is there to cut through deception. It is there to cut through the flesh. It is there to cut through offense. It is there to cut through guilt and shame and condemnation to bring clarity, to bring discernment, to through the mist when God's word comes through and brings clarity in your mind that he can start showing you who he says you are and not you can stop living in a life where the enemy says you are and what people have said about you, but you fill your mind constantly with his word. It cuts through the lies. Why? And I'll tell you this. God's word, and I'm read it to you now, changes and affects our body, soul, and spirit, thoughts, emotions, everything. Look at it. It says, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. When we are in God's word, he literally reshapes the way that we live. He reshapes our mind, our neurological pathways. Everything physically, spiritually, and emotionally changes when we are in His Word. We cannot have excuses to not be in His Word anymore. We have to find every opportunity we get to be in His Word. When we are in His Word, His voice becomes more clear. Why? John 10, verse 27 to 28, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will not perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hands. And just before that in verse John 10 verse 5, he said, A stranger they will not follow, but they will follow, but, sorry, but they will flee from him. For they do not know, they do not know the voice of a stranger. Have we perhaps become too familiar with the voice of a stranger instead of God's voice? By not filling our minds with his truth, just saying. Take note, his voice will never contradict his word. His voice will never contradict his word. Always be watchful. Always stand firm. When somebody brings a word to you of encouragement, does it align with scripture? When somebody preaches, does it align with scripture? When a thought comes into your mind, does it align with scripture? He doesn't speak outside of his word. His word, whatever confirmation will always be in line with God's word. It's important to know this. But you might be thinking, okay, Thomas, I struggle to believe whether I'm hearing God's voice or my own voice, right? We've been there. So what I hear when you say that, I hear that you need faith. You need faith to be able to discern. Now, cool, look at this. Romans 10 verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing how? Through the word of Christ. It always goes back to His Word. A firm foundation to stand on, to fight with, to believe, to allow, to reshape the way that we think and the way that we live, to fill our minds with absolute truth and clarity and to take out what doesn't belong to Him. If I want to grow in faith and I want to grow in in, in hearing His voice, I've got to spend more time on His Word. A.W. Tozer, as a very well-known Christian writer, preacher, he said the following quote, Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's word. If you can just keep believers in a place of, I just sing songs, that's cool. Come to church, like, uh, keep it there. Just go to your buddies for prayer, like, uh, just, just go on Facebook and look for somebody that posted a Christian thing and just go look for that. You'll be okay. No, you're not. You need to fill your mind constantly with his truth we've got to be in the scripture we've got to study the scriptures we've got to let the scripture study us why because your thoughts will either be taking you towards your calling or towards destruction but here's good news are you ready for this you've got a new teacher if you've given your life to jesus you've got a new teacher in life he's called the holy spirit and uh, john 14 26 it says he's the spirit of truth who will lead us into all truth he will teach us everything. He will remind us. He is the helper. He's the comforter. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will teach us to fight the way that Jesus fought. How? Through helping us to discern what is from God and what is not from God. Why? Because I mentioned it before. The devil used Scripture against Jesus. He knows Scripture. But if you know the Bible, you would know that the devil used it out of context. He might know it, but he doesn't know it in context. So that's why it's important for us to know Scripture within context. 
to believe it for what it is and what, it, what God has originally intended it for, for it to be. No scripture. Is it not true that sometimes we look in the mirror and we realize that we've become our own worst enemy? And what we face is because of years of grief, because of years of bitterness and offense and blame shifting and not dealing with lies, we've become our own worst enemy. And we've allowed certain lies, we've allowed certain lies to dominate in our minds. Now I say this to the youth every Friday, that if the shoe doesn't fit, kick it off. If I'm not speaking to you and you feel like, that's not me, then it's cool. But if you feel like, hey, this is for me. Maybe I've become my own worst enemy. I want to tell you this verse. You've probably heard it somewhere. Proverbs 18 verse 21. It says this. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Another verse that just adds to this. This one, is, this one cuts deep. James 3 verse 6. The tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. Setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. He says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. The problem is this, this tongue of ours, which we so freely use to speak death over people, sets on fire very important things in our life, like our minds, like our friendships, our families, our kids, our grandchildren, our finances, our health, our businesses, because we've been trained all our life to speak death instead of life. We have compromised just a little bit, just a little bit to say that it's okay. It's just a joke. I don't really mean it. But actually, we speak in death over people. And we have to teach ourselves. We've got to learn to keep our mouth shut and fill our minds with His Word. So that what we speak is full of peace and joy and only edifies and only builds people up. This is for all of us. We don't stand here from a place of perfection. We, all of us need to grow in this thing. Do we speak fire? Do we burn our families and our minds and our finances by the way that we speak? Do we choose to echo the voice of God or the voice of the devil? Because God gave us authority. He just mentioned it there. Over every reptile, over every creature, man has tamed it. God gave us authority to speak. What are you speaking over yourself? With that, there's friends of ours in, in, in the Northwest where we come from and their kids that assigned a science project. Maybe you've heard about this. They also do it with, pl with plants and stuff. So they took three strawber strawberries, right? Uh, and just quickly running through it. Strawberry number one, they all kept in the same conditions. So no benefit over the other one. Strawberry number one, they take a minute and they, and they speak positive words. You're the best strawberry. Oh, the most loveliest strawberry. Juicy. Love you. The best. Second strawberry, negative. Worst strawberry I've ever tasted in my life. I don't know where you're from, but you must go back there. The worst strawberry. Third strawberry, neglected. Don't talk to it. Don't do anything to it. I wish I had the picture because I, I used to actually have it. And where the study comes from is, back just to give you a short recap, 1970s, a guy called uh, Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird, they wrote a book called The Secret Life of Plants. And they believe that through studies that plants react to emotions. And blah, blah, blah. That's just scientist stuff. But... The truth is, if only they knew that there was actually life and death in the tongue, it would make a little bit more sense because they've done studies and it's shown. And what happened was the strawberry number one stayed fresh. They stayed fresh. It didn't get fraught, nothing. Strawberry number two got rotten, miffed. And strawberry number three, interesting, they didn't get miffed or rotten. It just it shriveled up. It was neglected. And I want to tell you this. This is the point. Understand that if we as humans have the ability to change the de poor destiny of those strawberries, how much more do we not have the ability to change what happens in our minds and in our hearts and our own well-being? If we can speak death over something that's outside of our human nature, how much do we not have the capability to speak death over ourselves? 
How much do we not change our own minds and our hearts by speaking negative and not speaking God's word? Do we perhaps have to learn how to speak more life? How? By taking our thoughts captive. Now, if you're listening to this, you're thinking, okay, now, how do, I, how do I become more aware of what increases lies? How do I move away from things that, can, uh, that increases lies and temptations so that I don't keep falling in the same thing? The number one thing to watch out for is isolation. Why? Because that's where the enemy thrives. Isolating yourself because of busyness. Isolating yourself because of grief or offense or bitterness. Isolating yourself away from God's people, away from God's covering, away from prayer, and away from what God has planned for you. You isolate yourself. And Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, Do not neglect the gathering of the saints. Isolation. Number two is doing Christian stuff without actually being with Jesus. Christian stuff without actually being with him. Okay, now, have you ever heard the story of Mary and Martha? Martha, she, it's in Luke 10 verse 38. Martha led Jesus into the house. Well, that's nice. Come, Jesus, we'll serve you. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to what he's saying. And Martha got annoyed. She's like, hey, Jesus, don't you, don't you care that, that she's just sitting here? I'm preparing food. I'm serving you. I'm coming to church every Sunday. I'm doing life groups. I'm doing all the right stuff. I'm listening to preachers on the YouTube whenever I get a chance. Like, I am just in it. And Jesus says, hey, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things. But Mary has chosen the good portion, that which cannot be taken away from her. She chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Because doing Christian stuff can just be another way to suppress lies instead of replacing lies. We can let Jesus into our lives without Him actually having our lives. He can be in your life, but does He have your life? The third thing is entertainment. The music and the movies that we watch and listen to. Does it edify, does it glorify God or the enemy? Now, I love music and I love movies. But we have to be careful what we watch and what we listen to. Be aware of the devil's devices. We live in a technical technology age. Do you not think that he will not use those things? Be careful what you listen to. If we have death, life and death in our tongue, I bet you that other people that we listen to has the same effect over us. And the movies that we watch, does it, do we find entertainment in the very things that Jesus died for? Do we find entertaining the stuff that we watch, knowing that those are the things that Jesus died to forgive us from? But we find it as entertainment, and we're okay with that. Number four is unhealthy friendships. We say this always at the youth. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. What we need is friends that will encourage you with God's word, not their opinion. Friends that pray for you, not complain with you. Friends that move you further in life to become more like Jesus and not more like the world. That remember that good advice doesn't mean it's God's advice or God's timing. you godly friends. But also, you are the company you surround yourself with. Number five is not letting go of the past and living in unforgiveness. The root of bitterness and offense is a wellspring of lies and temptations. If we keep and stay in that place. The great thing about being a follower of Jesus is that it is, you're going to be offended. You're going to get bitter. There's going to be moments of grief and moments of anger. But the great thing is we get to get God in it. We get to give it to Him. We get to talk to Him about it. But the problem is if, if we don't do that. And we let it linger and we let it stay there. Number six is neglecting, a, neglecting our prayer life and God's Word. We have to ask ourselves, why am I neglecting it? Do we not believe that it's important enough? Is it perhaps laziness? Do we have to do introspection? Are we perhaps so busy with life that we miss the giver of life? We have to ask ourselves these questions because we all go through times where we just feel like we have excuses to not get to God's Word. And, and as seasons change, it calls to different sacrifices as well. For example, um, I'm so happy Mark Fick, he, in, he introduced me to this app called Streetlights. Now, if you've ever listened to the YouVersion Bible app, I'm very sorry, but the guy's voice is extremely boring when you listen to it on Audible. But he introduces us to Streetlights, which is an app where it's also the Audible Bible, but it's got some beat with it. 
It's got some lack of background beats. So it's perfect. If you want to go to the gym, you go for a walk, you put the Bible in your ears, you listen to it. The point is, wherever you get an opportunity, fill yourself with this word. Amen? Take your thoughts captive before they take you captive. And as I come to an end of this message, as I come to an end, I want, I want all of us to know this, that approaching life, we need to take Scripture seriously. We need to fill our minds with this. And we need to learn to take the thoughts captive. We need to learn to get the Word of God somewhere in your life, whether it's on your walls, whether it's on your phone, always have access to it. So that when thoughts become overwhelming, you don't have to run away. You don't have to suppress it, ignore it. You can replace it with God's Word. The question is, do you think that God wants you to be tormented in your mind? Do you really think that God who sent His one and only Son for us to give us life, to give us His mind, to give us His spirit, do you really think He's like, ah, I don't care, you can be tormented in your mind? It's not true. And you don't have to believe that it's true. And you don't have to believe that that's your story and that's going to be your life. You can take your thoughts captive. And I'm finishing with the scripture in Philippians 4 verse 8. And it says, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, I promise, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. I like that the way it says it. Fix it, meaning get the spanner in there and fix it. But also focus, fix your thoughts on that which is true. Ooh, Jesus, His word, who He says about you. That which is honorable, honoring God and honoring one another. That which is right, living a, ri a righteous life, fighting against injustice. That which is pure, a pure mind, a pure thought, not greedy, not boastful, not arrogant. That which is lovely, that which is aligned with the very character of God, because He is love. That which is admirable, that which means I am living a life that is worthy of the gospel that Jesus has called me for. And when I was preparing this message, I asked God, Highlight for me some thoughts, some lies that people are facing here this very morning. And may you do something in their minds. May you do something in their hearts. And these are the, 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 the lies that I felt God dropped in my heart, but it, it is not excluding yours. It is just added. Because the fact is that He's God, He knows, and He sees it. But I believe that there's people this morning, you believe that you're not a good enough mom. You believe that lie too long. That you've believed that you will just turn out like your dad. That you've believed that your kids are not going to make it. Lies of that your business will fail. Lies of you've messed up too much. Lies of just end your life. Lies of the temptation is too much to carry for you. That God has left you and that He's disappointed with you. Lies of my life is too busy. But this addiction is too much for me to handle. And this morning I believe that you will encounter the Prince of Peace. I didn't know that they were going to sing the song Tremble. But I believe, I believe when I wrote this down, I believe that God wants to bring a peace because He is the Prince of Peace. And He wants to give you peace, perfect peace. And if that is you, that person, that you feel like those thoughts have overwhelmed your life and other thoughts, fear and worry and torment, you can't sleep. I want to ask you, can we all stand together? Can we all stand together? I want to pray over you. And what I am going to encourage you with, as we've got this ministry center right here, this area, open area, and after the service, there's always leaders here that wants to pray for you. Now, I want to pray over you corporately, and I believe that the elders, they will agree with me, and they, they are praying with me and trusting God to bring peace to your heart and to your mind. But most of all, that you take that step of boldness to say enough is enough. You draw the line. Not today, devil. I'm drawing a line today. And you'll go there and let them pray with you. Speak to somebody. Because whatever is kept in the darkness, the enemy just feeds on that thing. But whatever exposed, is exposed by the light becomes free. So let's close our eyes together. Lord Jesus, in your great name and in your great power, I want to pray over every person that is standing here this morning. 
and I want to speak the name of Jesus over you right now. I want to pray the Prince of Peace over your life, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard your heart and to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. I pray that from today, you will never allow the enemy to deceive you. You will never allow a lie to rest and to stay in your mind. I speak the blood of Jesus Christ over your body, soul, and spirit. I believe and I pray that from today you will get a new hunger for His Word. I believe that you will walk in victory, not with a victim mindset. I believe that Jesus will restore things in your life because you are going to take a step of action to believe who He says you are. Because I declare over you, not by my authority, but by the authority of Christ, that you are loved, that you are worthy of the blood of the cross, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and that today it's, we say, devil, the Lord rebukes you in Jesus' name. The Lord rebukes you in Jesus' name. You have no right, and we rebuke every stronghold and every foothold that has been made over every person's mind and heart today in Jesus' name. And we say offense, you leave in the name of Jesus right now. Bitterness, you leave in Jesus' name. And we say no longer. Today, we draw the line as God's people to walk in victory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You guys are...